So my talk is about whether 10,000 hours and, and ten, well, 10,000 hours of training, can that be overruled, can it be beaten through our use of technology? 10,000 hours. Where has where this come from? Where has this idea actually come from? And you may have seen this in the press. And what this idea is, it was coined by a guy called Malcolm Gladwell in, in 2008. And it was a really, really simple concept. It was based on a research paper in 93 by Anders Ericsson. And the idea was this. But if you could actually perform 10,000 hours of dedicated specific training to any task, art, dance, music, elite sport, that you would ultimately become an expert in that particular field. And thinking about this, I don't know whether I feel happy or saddened by that prospect. Happy because I now know that as a human being on this earth, I can achieve absolutely anything, anything at all. But I'm sad by that because now suddenly art and all the passions that we have has now boiled down to little more than a question of numbers. And this troubles me a little bit. But there's another thing as well. To do 10,000 hours, if you wanted to be a great dancer or a you know, sports person and you gave up, half an hour of your time, so you stop watching your soap opera on your TV at night, and, you know, and go and, and do this every night, it will take you 53 years to achieve that number, which means I should be an Olympic gold medalist by the time I'm 90. Okay. Um, alternatively, I could make this my full-time passion. If you look on the internet, you'll actually see this happen. Uh, I remember reading this book about someone trying to do this with golf. Uh, and if I did 20 hours a week, I would achieve that in about 10 years, which gives you a bit of an idea of how Olympic athletes in particular actually perform. That's about the time they come to maturity. So I'm sitting there thinking, well, don't you want to be good at something? Don't you want to be great at something? But we all have busy lives. We have children, we have jobs, we have pensions and taxes and all the list goes on. But I still want to have that ability to be great at something. How can I do that? So what I thought about was I was going to show you a way, and I'm going to put it in the context of elite sport because that's the subject I'm most comfortable with, of how potentially you could do that and how you could take lessons from that and hopefully that will make it transferable to many other walks of life that you have. Now, the problem of elite sport, I like to really simplify and I put it down to two things. There are two basic forces that will dictate your performance. They are your assisting forces, so that could be things like your physiology, the training, the, the effort that you put into something, and the resistant forces. And these are the things that are holding you back, and that could be the environment, the equipment that you use. Now, ultimately, this 10,000 hour concept really falls into the assistance. It's the amount of effort that you put into something. So I'm going to try and cheat that rule. We can't change that. I can, if, if it's going to take me 50 odd years to get there, then I, I haven't got that kind of time. I'll be dead before it's all over, and I'll be too old to write the results up. So we're going to focus on the resistance. And I'm going to promote three basic ideas that will hopefully give you a means to be able to achieve that. Number one, the aggregation of marginal gains. Now, you might not have heard of this expression. It was coined by Sir David Brailsford, uh, who at the time was in charge of the Great Britain track cycling team, the all-conquering track cycling team. And the idea of this is very, very simple. Rather than trying to improve one thing by 100%, try instead to improve 100 things by 1% because that's likely to be more achievable. So ultimately, in our system, and if we take that of a, of a cyclist, rather than trying to improve his physical performance by 100%, which is gonna be impossible, let's look at the little things and add them all up, because our chances of success are far likely to actually be higher. So in the case of the cyclist, we could look at the aerodynamics, and if you bear this in mind, 96% uh, of the effort it takes you to ride a bicycle through the air at 30 miles an hour is actually the aero, no, it's, it's the air resistance working against you. It's trying to slow you down. And 30% of your effort to overcome that can actually be attributed to the equipment. So actually, there's quite a lot that you can work with here to help improve your performance without actually doing any more hours training. All it requires is time spent in terms of gaining knowledge and speaking to the right people. We can improve the aerodynamics of the wheels. We can improve the fabric of the skin suit to allow the airflow to flow over the rider better, or their helmet. 
we can look at the bearings, reduce the resistance. And that's exactly what Great Britain did. And that's one of the primary cornerstones of why they did so well. So look at the aggregation of marginal gains. Second one, turning an apparent weakness into a strength. Now what I mean by this is sometimes it's good to look at the things that are holding us back that, that seem quite obvious that you can't work with and actually seeking a means to improve them. Consider this, you might recognise this. This is an Amber 2 runner and if you can cast your mind back to around right about 2008, this was a very, very exciting time in sport because the question was raised about what does it actually mean to be human anymore because athletes using prosthetic limbs like this actually got to the point whereby it was felt that they could compete equally uh, with people that were able-bodied. And this is a fantastic situation to be in, because disability no longer becomes a barrier. And how have they actually achieved that? And they actually looked at the technology to do that, and these particular athletes used what uh, is known as an energy storage and return prosthesis. And it went from early calls of, wow, isn't this fantastic? to in the end basically being, oh God, they're cheating. That's, that's how <laughs> dramatic the change was. How did they actually do it? Maybe you actually wondered how this actually happened. I'll, I'll, there's several possible reasons why this has happened. And I, I will suggest that this is quite limited because one of the, the limitations of disability athletes is there's not a lot of them. So any scientist will tell you that unless you've got a good sample, your findings have limitations anyway. The first thing was, was that athletes use this technology could actually swing and reposition their legs faster than the able-bodied equivalent. There's less weight there and it requires less momentum. That's one potential reason why. The other reason that everyone felt that it was possible that there was a performance advantage was because of uh, what's been coined as the trampoline effect. You can imagine yourself on a child's swing in the playground and you're pushing your child. You know that after a while you can get in harmony with it and that child will gain height. Or if on a trampoline if you want to go higher, you just apply your weight at the right moment in time and you go higher. If you want to stop, you work against that and your height reduces. You move out of phase, basically. And what we feel has happened in this particular case is double amputees, people that use a double prosthesis, basically are at a certain point in the race and they hit a certain speed when their oscillation is at the right rate, their frequency is at the right rate, that actually they get in harmony and then achieve more efficiency and greater running distance as a result. And that's why, if you ever watch TV footage of this, you'll see athletes with double amputation suddenly being nowhere at the start to then flying through at the finish when everyone else is slowing down and on their knees. So it's just a different style of running. But the point here for you is to actually think about disability, oh, that's bad, actually isn't. And the reason is, is that we can use design as a means to come up with the great solutions. And the best way to design is to forget preconceptions and actually focus on what the actual basic problem is. What is the problem you're trying to solve? And historically, one of the reasons for bad design in things like this is that they were trying to restore what was ultimately the human leg. The reason this kind of engineering works is because they actually focus on what's the problem? We need to run fast. What do we need to do to run fast? Well, we need to do this kind of speed, this kind of rate. So the actual ultimate solution ends up not looking like a human leg at all. It's so you, you, you unhinge yourself and remove preconceived blocks of what you think a design solution is and focus instead on what it actually needs to do. So that's number two. Number three, the early bird gets the worm. What this means is that the person who gets in first sometimes with new technology is ultimately the one that will reap the rewards of it. To give you a good example of this, consider this speed skater for a moment. Now way back in 1996, I think it was 97, there was a massive change in Olympic speed skating. Results changed dramatically. And the reason for that purely came down to the footwear that you see there. If you look at his left foot, that was what traditional speed skates were like. It was where there was a blade on the base of the boot, and it was fixed, and they would skate around at high speed. But then someone came up with a really, really novel application solution to this, and what they created is what's now been known as, as the clap skate, partly because of the noise it makes. And what it, how it actually works, and it's really shown well by the right-hand boot here, is that the blade is free to move at the rear, but pivots at the front. And what that innovation actually does 
is it actually allows the boot to stay in contact with the ice. It's that fraction of a second longer, which means that as the speed skater is driving their leg, they get that little bit more drive, a little bit more thrust. And just that light, small design change completely changed the results in the Olympics. So how does, it, how does this apply here? What, what this means is that the athletes that were open-minded enough to jump in and use that technology in that one Olympic Games in 1996 and the World Championships at the same time wrecked massive rewards. Now, as what will happen later is everyone eventually will catch up and realise that it's a good idea, but there was that initial window of success for those that were brave enough to take it. And that's the subtle difference here. And this isn't the only time this has happened. Uh, there was a cyclist in 1993, uh, Graeme Obrey, who completely revolutionised track cycling by going from a traditional riding position, which was almost like that, to bringing his arms in and tucked in like, like that. It's called almost like the praying mantis position. Now bear in mind here, Obrey was a Scotsman with no education, uh, was completely unknown on the international stage, and then ultimately he ended up winning uh, world championships and the, the cycling hour record. Um, just purely by looking at from a point of basic principles of what do I need to do to go fast? Not, what do I need to do to be a fast cyclist? So you take that step back. Um, actually, the irony of his story was, was that they actually banned him for that position. Uh, so he came back again two years later and did it again. And this time he created a position that was like that, called the Superman. And they banned that as well. But the point was, <laughs> was that he was a creative mind and he had the ability to look beyond preconceptions. And he took that small window of opportunity, which ultimately led to great success and now forms a reference point for those of us that are interested in technology, in, in my case, in sport. There is actually, for the more cynical in the audience here, there is actually an expression whereby, and um, the saying goes, the early bird gets the worm, but it's the second mouse that gets the cheese. Okay? Um, but I don't like to subscribe to that, if you can sort of see the meaning with that. Anyway, so then, can you trump that 10,000 hours? Have I demonstrated it to you? And the answer is no. Because the reason is that ultimately, with most things that you do that are physically related, it's always going to boil in the end down to how you actually physically perform, your physiology. But here's the thing. That 10,000 hour rule isn't actually what you think. Because when Ericsson, who promoted it in 93, he was a psychologist, and Gladwell, in 2008 was a journalist and they what they didn't really appreciate is there is a world of difference between someone playing chess and someone wanting to run a marathon and research since these kind of ideas were promoted have shown us of the important role of genetics something actually that Ericsson has strongly argued against but he's wrong and I'll tell you why I think he's wrong in my humble opinion because recent research has shown us that 50%, well, there's a, there's a key metric in endurance sports called VO2 max, and it's basically the, uh, the rate at which your body uses, the maximal, most efficient rate that your oxygen is used in your muscles and your organs at race pace kind of intensities. 50% of your ability to have that, whatever that level is, is defined by your parents. And 50% of your ability to train that quality is also hereditary and defined probably by your parents. Choose your parents wisely is a very well known term. <laughs> um, so ultimately, the 10,000 hours may not even be true. It may not even apply. So if you take all of that, where does that leave us? Well, ultimately, that means then if you cannot change your physical abilities, the only thing less that you can change, that you here can control, is your ability to use technology. <laughs> to kind of put that in perspective, now, I, I, saw, I found this image and it always makes me laugh, um, but actually this has more serious undertones and let me explain why. Um, there's one big caveat to everything I'm saying here. Technology is the only thing that you can change, it is the only thing you can influence, and my conclusion here is ultimately that is the way to which to improve. But something to take away for you is this very image. Um, you can change the rules of the game a little bit too far sometimes. But there is a need for both vigilance and thought about what you're doing. And it requires a moral compass. Because when you do make a dramatic change in technology, the system that you are part of, that we are all part of, changes. And that can have detrimental effects. There was an idea called the revenge effect 
uh, by an author called Edward Tenner in a book called Why Do Things Bite Back? And his idea was that sometimes when you introduce technology into a system, that there is actually a byproduct of that that actually may be unwanted. So, for example, nuclear power gives us an, almost an endless supply of power, but ultimately produces a large amount of waste that we struggle to get rid of. So there does require a need for both vigilance and awareness of what you're actually doing. However, just to sort of conclude my little talk here, um, the thing I'd like to really sort of say is that if the only thing, once you get past genetics, if the only thing you can do is technology, then the only limits to your success are not your genetics, but ultimately the only limits to this are two things. And they are your moral compass, your ethical beliefs of what you feel is right, what is wrong, and lastly, ultimately the limits of your own imagination. Because as I've shown in some of the examples, it's, it's your attitude to how we create things, how you design things, and finally how you use things that will make the difference in your success, be it sport or anything else that you choose to do. Thank you very much.